Hello there! I am Zulaire Law, and this is The Joy of Computer Gaming, where we investigate good and unusual examples of computer gaming history. Today's highlighted game is Fublitsky, the four Fidos following the footpath to find Fubles or falling furniture, frisking your fellows for fallen fortunes, and finally fetching the four Faded Finds game. It's a board game with both real boards and a virtual board, which makes it one of a kind so far as I'm aware. It was released by Infocom in 1986 on the Apple II, Atari 8-bit, and in MS-DOS. For this video, I played the Atari 8-bit version, since that's the version I played growing up. This is one of Infocom's least known products, and apparently my family was one of the few that actually bought this game back when it was new. The game is sort of a mix of Clue and Mastermind, with some randomness thrown into it as well. It's quite memorable because of how unique it is as a product, but sadly, this did not result in a very good game. Almost everything is designed to be displayed in monochrome, with varying sorts of dithering. On a television, the artifacted colors are very much all done accidentally, which gives a lot of the game a blurry look. Aside from the game map, pop-up displays appear, either showing an event occurring in the game or prompting you to make a selection. The players and the objects in the game are all cute cartoony graphics, mostly white with black borders, making them stand out a lot against the dithery backgrounds. The player characters are cute beagle-like dogs that do whatever tasks are before them while walking on all fours, like carrying their baggies, crossing the street, cleaning dishes, and being a victim of all sorts of unfortunate circumstances along the way. All of the people you meet are humans instead, which makes it a bit jarring contrasting between NPCs and the player characters. As you play, everything is conveyed without words, from the beginning of the game, throughout the entire experience, with thumbs up and down for success or failure, checks or X's for matching or not items, and so on. This is all the complete opposite of just about every other Infocom game up to this point, come to think of it, where words were the entire game. There is very little animation with just two frames of animation wherever there is any. It also flickers and tears quite a lot because the graphics engine was designed to be cross-platform more than fast. The game ends up having a very unique look to it, and unfortunately it's also the best aspect of the game. Every player controls the game with a joystick. When objects are shown around a controller prompt, you press the direction you want and then press the button. On the board, you press a cardinal direction to move a space, and press the button to interact with whatever you're standing on, or to end your turn if you have run out of movement points. It'd be very easy to play through the game this way if only the controls were very responsive at all. You really have to hold directions to get them to react, and hold the button down for a long time. Except you also have to release the button to complete an action or the game will just hang. The basic premise of the game is that every player picks one of the various items in the game without the other players knowing what was picked. If less than four players are in the game, the computer picks the remainder so that four items are always selected. When you start the game, your pick will automatically be in one of your two lockers in the game. The only hit you get is the cost of each item, which is 4, 8, or 16 foobles. When you think you have the correct set of four items, you head to one of the checkpoints in the middle of the map. If you're correct, you win and the game is over. Otherwise, you are only told how many items you have that are correct, not which they are. Since aside from picking your items in the beginning, other players can see your turns, which tends to be to your advantage. Since you can only hold four items, though, you better hope you're certain which is which. The game is played in turns, round robin. You roll, do an activity, and then your turn is over, and it's the next player's turn. You have an amount of money called foobles, starting with an amount equal to twice the value of all the winning items selected. However, along the way, many things may happen to cause you to lose money, such as buying items, getting injured, having it stolen, or going into the underground gliding highway. You can only earn foobles by selling previously purchased items at a pawn shop for half price, or working in a restaurant cleaning dishes for four foobles a turn. Though the chance man may also give you money, but good luck getting that to be reliable. There are four of each of the six different types of shops on the map, one in each quadrant, each with three items that cost, you guessed it, four, eight, or sixteen foobles. These are always the same for each type of shop. A drugstore always sells hairspray for four, toothpaste for eight, and eyedroppers for sixteen. However, each one only has a single of each item, and the selected items are taken from a shop at random when the game starts. The only exception is if the item was selected three or four times, there will be triple the number of times it was picked, available to allow everybody to purchase them. When you go into a shop with all three items in stock, you must buy one, but you can only ever buy one item per turn. There is a phone book that lets you call any one of the 24 shops on the map to learn what they have in stock, though you only get one call per turn. 
There are two pawn shops in the upper right and the lower left, where you can sell items at half price or buy any stolen, donated, or sold items for three quarters the price, though it's random which one stolen and donated items appear in. There are two checkpoints near the center to check whether you have the right items or not. The underground gliding highway costs six foobles to enter, but you can stay in it as long as you want. It comprises of two sets of four locations, the outermost moving you clockwise a quadrant each turn, whereas the inner set moves you counterclockwise. There are also two lockers, which can hold one item per player, and a charity central where you can drop off all of your items at once but not get paid for it. You can bump into another player on the sidewalk after you've started moving. This causes both of you to drop all of your items, then each of you picks one up until you both have the quantity you had at the start of the bump. Then it shows everybody which items you both have. This is the only way to directly influence another player, except perhaps to buy something from a store they were about to visit so they cannot. Like most older board games, randomization governs a lot of the things that happen on your path to your actual goal. You have to make a roll from 1 to 24 for how many spaces you can move. When you cross a street with an X on it, it's random whether you get hit by a passing car or not and sent to the hospital. If you run out of movement on the sidewalk, you may come across a chance man who will pick something random to do from give you another turn, give you some money, sell you an item cheap, one of which is a correct item, steal an item from you, take money from you, or maybe even drop a piano on your head because why not? Whenever you are injured, it costs three foobles for the ambulance fee to go to the hospital. Once there, you can try to roll a multiple of three to get out early, costing three foobles a turn for up to a max of three turns, or just pay ten foobles immediately to get out. You always have to use all of your movement points, land on a location, or bump into another player before your turn would end. Going backwards gives back your movement points, so you would have to find a loop or the like if you don't actually want to move. Thankfully, the game did have options from the main screen to change some rules a little. You can change the chance man to show up more or less often, for him to have good or bad events more often, to have the crosswalks get you hit more often or less often by cars, increase or decrease the starting amount of money, increase or decrease the pay at the restaurants, all the way up to 10 per turn, choose to have a set locker for the selected items in the beginning, and choose to have a set pawn shop for stolen or donated items to appear in. The manual also has a bunch of house rules for you to try. If this was a fun game to play, I could see these being interesting alternate rules to try in the game. The game came with four boards and dry erase markers to allow playing the game multiple times. The boards had a high-res image of the map, which was helpful. It also has what stores sell what, and had a lot of space for taking notes. It's still a fairly unique feature of the game. There is no music, and the sounds in the game are fairly minimal. In 1988, my family got an Atari 8-bit newsletter program called The Newsroom. My mother used it to make silly family newsletters to send to my father while he was out to sea in 1988 and 1990. Its clip art reminded me a lot of Fublitsky, and you can see why. There are no artists in common between the two programs, though, as far as I'm aware. Back to Fublitsky, I remember my mother was excited when we first got this game in 1986, since it was such a new idea. However, aside from playing the game a couple times just after it arrived, it didn't get used much. Nobody really cared for it, it wasn't a particularly fun game in the first place, and the sluggishness of the Atari 8-bit version made it so much worse to play for more than a game on rare occasion. The actual game itself never was particularly engaging or fun, especially since most of the game is just moving around, trying not to get screwed by random events, and lots of waiting for all of the other players to slowly take their turns. We unanimously hated the ambiguity of the checkpoints, and how slow everything was, and how much time you had to spend licking plates, and how often you got hit by cars. And you know what? Just don't play this game, except to perhaps experience an oddity for yourself. The Apple II version is nearly identical to the Atari 8-bit version, except the sounds are more muted and it runs a little faster, which is odd considering the Atari's processor is nearly identical but ran about 50% faster than the Apple II's. You can see that the colors are a little different as well, but that was normal between those two systems. With a controller, you controlled it the same way as well, and it too felt unresponsive, though a little less so. 
I'll show more samples in the comparison. In the MS-DOS version, my first mistake was that I tried it with 2000 cycles in MS-DOS to see if that helped with it feeling sluggish. The game at the menu was pretty fast, which I thought, foolishly, would help the game be more playable. But at that speed, the game constantly pulls down and to the right, even though there's no joystick support. Slowing the game down to 1000 didn't help either, and when I did get into the game, the pulling to the right went away, but at the end of the very first turn, the game locked up. Running the game below 500 cycles lets the game be played properly, but then you have to deal with it being sluggish all over again. Still faster than the other versions, at least. My second mistake was trying to use the arrow keys and return for the button. This barely functioned at all. I tried the number pad and found that it worked better, and also let you do the diagonals in the item selection. Pressing 5 was the button here. It still didn't respond particularly well, you had to hold the button down for too long to get a reaction, but it felt a little better to use. Aside from that, this looks and plays just like the Atari 8-bit version on a monitor, except one small change. When you go to a shop, all of the items have three frames of animation on a four-frame loop instead of just being static. They don't animate in the pawn shop, I guess because animating four things at once was too much.
Fublitsky was born from Infocom's desire to get into graphical games. All of Infocom's text adventures were written to work with the ZIL that allowed easy porting of their games to various systems. This worked great for text adventure games. Infocom wanted to have that, but for graphics as well, and Fublitsky was the game that they tried it out on. The Universal Graphics Engine was only ever made for the Atari 8-bit, Apple II, and MS-DOS. Because none of the strengths of any of the systems targeted for release could be exploited by this, the game suffered by being limited in display and very sluggish. The game did technically have a limited release in 1985, only advertising to people on Infocom's mailing list. That also included a button and a survey about the game, so many sources argue whether to count this game under 1985 or 1986. Because of this, some sources, such as Wikipedia, say the game was released in 1985, whereas others, such as Moby Games, say it was released in March of 1986. I'm going off the latter, 1986, since that is when it was available to pretty much anybody that wanted to buy it, not that that helped its sales. Most sources mention the game sold only 8,225 copies by the end of 1986. After that, more units were being returned than sold. It really did not sell well. Way too many people were involved in the creation of Fublitsky for me to go into much detail on most of them. I've included all sorts of links for anybody that cares to learn more. I've seen sources that mention different people as part of the creation process for the game than simply who is listed in the manual, which only credits Michael Berlin, Brian Cody, Posey Lim, and Paula Maxwell. Oddly enough, Wikipedia doesn't even mention Brian Cody at all, even though he did almost all of the graphics, my favorite part of the game, and Paula was hired by him as an assistant, and she is listed. Mike Berlin was the project manager and designer for the game. He joined Infocom in 1983 or so, and wrote Infocom's Infidel and Suspended games, as well as co-authored Cutthroats. After leaving Infocom in around 1986, he contributed to a few games in the 1990s, including Altered Destiny, Live Action Football, Bubsy, and Bubsy 3D. He started Cascade Mountain Publishing along with his wife Muffy in 1998 to publish ebooks and interactive fiction such as Once in Future, Chameleon, and Dr. Dumont's Wild P-A-R-T-I, but it went out of business in 2000. For a while, he left the world of gaming to write and also produced light jazz albums with a group known as Hot Mustard. In around 2012, he and his wife created another company, Flexible Tales, under which he has created a few casual iOS games, such as Grok the Monkey in 2012 and Og in 2016. Posey Lim was responsible for some of the graphics display code. Aside from being known as Magic Lim because of his love of magic numbers in his code, I can't find anything else about him. He didn't do any other work for Infocom, and there are far too many people with the same name. Brian Cody only worked for Infocom on this one game and was laid off in early 1985, well before it was released. He says that he was hired there in late 1982 to help make Infocom's first graphical game and designed the box art, the manual, and the graphics in the game. After Infocom, he took a lot of commercial art gigs. He ended up landing in management at Digital Equipment for 10 years and then Director of Marketing Services at Sybase for 5 years. I do not know what he's done since then, but he still does artwork and lives in Ipswich, Maryland. He has a few samples of his more recent artwork on his website, which I've included a link to. Paula Maxwell was hired by Brian Cody to help with some of the animations. According to Brian, she only worked there for six months, she was laid off before he was, and she moved back to California. I can't find anything else about her. Four other people were mentioned as contributors to the game in the various interviews I read. Mark Blank, Dan Horn, Andrew Kolosniaki, and John Pallas. Mark Blank was one of the creators of the original Zork, which spawned the most successful series for Infocom. For Fublitsky, he helped Berlin with the designing part of the project. Dan Horn was responsible for managing the team that ported the original Infocom engine to the vast number of systems it supported, and helped design the graphics system. Andrew Kluzniaki was their 6502 and 6809 processor specialist, who supposedly created the Apple II and Atari 8-bit graphics engines used by Fublitsky. John Pallas was primarily a project manager for the Fublitsky team, which just sounds odd because supposedly both Mike Berlin and Mark Blank also supposedly contributed to project managing. Infocom is best known for making text adventures, especially its Zork series, which was originally created by Mark Blank and Dave Lebling while they were at MIT in 1977. They joined together with many other members of MIT in 1979 to form Infocom to be able to start selling their games. The original Zork was written in a language specifically used for the PDP-10 they used at the university, so it was decided that their games should be made in a new, similar language that they could just port to any system they wanted. This was called the Zork Implementation Language, or ZIL, which is a Lisp-like bytecode that could run on a virtual ZIP or Z-Machine Interpreter program on any target system that supported text input and output. 
This allowed them to code support just for the ZIP on each computer system they wanted to sell their games on, instead of for each game. Zork was sliced up into three parts to fit onto personal computer floppies, and the first part was first commercially released in 1980 on the TRS-80. The other two parts came out in 1981 and 1982. Infocom was able to increase their sales year by year by supporting all of their games on new computer systems, and they even released games for some business systems such as the PDP-11 that no other game company supported because of their ZIP. By 1984, over 250,000 copies of the Zork series games had sold, and by 1986 another 430,000 copies were sold, an incredible amount back then. They also produced many other text adventures on this platform, with Deadline, Infidel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Wishbringer, Ballyhoo, and so on. They had a much larger white-collar post-college audience than other game companies with their fancy graphics, and this was largely who they targeted. Also, a feature that many users appreciated was that the games generally came with feelies, unique physical items relating to the game. Their text adventures were almost all fairly successful games, with many selling over 100,000 copies. At the end of 1983, all 10 of Infocom's games at the time were in the top 40 best sellers. But the money these games were bringing in was not enough for the people running the company, and they decided they wanted to get into the business side of software. Since Lotus, which was located in the same building as Infocom, had just started seeing a great deal of success with their 1-2-3 database software, Infocom decided to create their own database program called Cornerstone. It would run on a new interpreted intermediate language so they could port it to multiple systems just like their games. This required hiring many new developers to work on it, and Infocom needed to borrow millions of dollars to support the development. When it was released in 1985 for MS-DOS, it was generally panned in favor of other databases. It didn't contain a query or scripting language, nor support standalone or third-party database access, which were two key features that made other databases of the time sought after. Because it ran on an interpreter, it was also fairly slow compared to its competitors. It never sold very well, only reaching around 10,000 sales, which left the company in severe debt. In 1986, Infocom was purchased by Activision, which didn't help matters for the company as unreasonable requirements were regularly given to them. Activision used their name for a short while to publish a few other games, such as the only other Infocom game I played, Battletech The Crescent Hawk's Inception, developed by Westwood and released in 1988. In 1989, Infocom was shut down after years of losses, and only five employees from the original company were hired under Activision. In 1988, Activision also wanted to get into business applications and rebranded itself to Mediagenic. This venture proved very unsuccessful for the company, and by 1991, they found themselves very much in debt. Doesn't this sound familiar? In what sounds like an alternate universe, the hero of this story is none other than the current CEO of Activision, Bobby Kotick. Bobby Kotick bought the company as it was going bankrupt, downsized it severely, massively changed how it operated, and renamed it back to Activision. The biggest first sale they had under his leadership was The Lost Treasures of Infocom, a large compilation of 20 of Infocom's games for $99, which sold over 100,000 copies in its first year. Infocom's old software helped Activision take off again, with some game reviewers at the time calling it a rising like a phoenix resurrection of the company. Also, thanks to this collection, my wife was able to play the older Infocom games when she was growing up.